It's my feel good breakfast show. Welcome back as we dive into a vitally important conversation that affects all of us as we reflect on World Wildlife Day, observed annually on the 3rd of March. And we are joined in studio by Monet Duplessis, the very proud CEO of the World Wildlife Fund South Africa. I think one of the world's most respected and capable conservation organizations. Yeah, it's wonderful. Monet, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's great to get some feedback in terms of what is being done. I know that um, it's a constant education out there, making people aware of what the WWF is doing, but there's so much aspects to what you guys are doing. I want to start on the black rhino. I don't think we need to remind people that the black rhino is severely under threat as well, but with the WWF expansion project, I mean, they are doing some incredible work, you guys and the team. What, what is being done? What are we looking at at the moment? Yeah, I think uh, just to to go to the statistics, you know, in the st between 1970 and 1990, there was a massive slaughter of black rhinos across Africa, mm -hmm. from 70,000 animals down to 2,300. Wow, so that's massive. So I mean, just massive. And 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 since then, uh, slowly we've managed. We, meaning the conservation community, have built the numbers back to about 6,000. Here in South Africa, WWF South Africa has uh, a, a range expansion project. And uh, there we've translocated 250 animals into 16 new populations. And those have added another 200 and some calves uh, to the population. So that's growing faster than even the poaching threat is, is, is threatening us. So success story. Congratulations. Sure. And we amazing. know that it's a massive collaborative effort. So mm -hmm. well done to all the partners involved. I know you guys don't need the validation. You do this as just a passion and purpose. And that's why you are there out there fighting every day. When we do get successes, it's great. And when we talk about the Cape Mountain Zebra, at one point down to 90 animals, what do their numbers look like right now? Yes, you know, they, so in the 1950s, so it's very recent that the numbers were right down below 100 animals. And uh, sure. we're looking at numbers that are exceeding 2,000 now. Wow. Uh, there were originally just three very small populations, genetically distinct populations on mountains. You know, so the, the um, Craddock uh, Mountain Zebra National Park was originally established. That's the biggest uh, population. And then the Kamanasi in the Little Karoo, as well as the Khamkaberg Nature Reserve. And WWF has contributed mm -hmm. significantly to the latter, to the Khamkaberg Nature Reserve, to expand that protected area. Very recently, we've uh, helped Cape Nature, the, the uh, conservation partners, to expand and, and to build connections between mountain ranges by linking Brilliant. through the plains so that the animals can now move freely between these uh, subpopulations. Yeah. But the private sector, of course, have been very, very instrumental also in uh, developing small populations of these, uh, but the big populations are still with the state. Well yeah, and so, uh, well we, can, we can clearly see it's such a huge collaborative effort to put something like this in place. Talk to us about the African penguin. Um, so some of the threats, what, what, what are their threats and what are we looking at currently? It looked like a sigh was about <laughs> to come <laughs> out, but he let it out, Bru, just let it out. <laughs> well, I mean, the penguin I'm very fond of because it's mm. also black and white like the panda. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it fits the brand. Yeah, yeah. it fits the brand. But uh, penguins, uh, the African penguin is in dire straits. We've, we've lost about 70% of its population uh, just in the last 20 years. So this has been a massive decline. They massively threatened. Um, and, uh, you know, there are various factors at play. But one of the big things that uh, scientists believe is happening is um, the um, uh, uh, food availability for parents to feed their chicks. Oh. So remember, when you're breeding, uh, you have your eggs and your chicks on an island in a nest. And you can only swim so far to find food. So you have a limited range. Mm of reach and if the food is, is densities they decline then uh, you're in trouble and then the population slowly but surely and in this case very rapidly uh, moves backwards what then is the answer because that feels like a very big problem yeah. affecting a is very it, small is it a species a yeah. matter of overfishing and what we are seeing yeah so you know that's one of the contributing the factors not the only one climate change is another mm. uh, um, uh, bunkering you know where where ships uh, um, uh, you know wash out their their tanks and things and and transfer 
oil, you know, from one uh, vessel to another. To another yeah. So these things are uh, they very uh, uh, penguins are very vulnerable in, in in that sense. So with BirdLife South Africa, Sandcob and other Endangered Wildlife Trust, WWF and many other organisations are working hard to to find the um, expansion of mm. exclosures, so fishing exclosures around the breeding islands mm. to make sure that at least during breeding uh, they have first dibs on, on, <laughs> on what's available. On the water, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, that is, it's, it's intense if you think about it because it's such a, a big problem that needs to be solved um, and, and it'll take incredible hard work. Uh, I want to move on to freshwater fish as well. We can't forget about that. And there's one specifically, the Twier River Redfin, uh, considered one of South Africa's most threatened species. Yes, so, so um, uh, freshwater fish are among the most threatened uh, groups of species anyway. You know, river systems have generally been neglected, uh, heavily polluted, degraded through mm -hmm. agricultural activities. And then in the, in the case of the Twier redfin, um, uh, specifically, also the introduction of uh, predatory fish that don't belong in those river systems. So they get, they're copying it from all directions. Habitat degradation on the one hand, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pollution and, and, and uh, um, other external factors in the water yeah. quality but then also uh, predatory fish. Mm. And so, you know, f for this, of course, the, the work that's happening, the Twier River is a catchment, a small river system inside the Cedarberg. It's a very, very small system. And uh, WWF has uh, big programs going on and, and the uh, farming communities there are responding very, very positively. What I love about this is sure. it might seem Thank like you. just one small instance, but it raises the baseline for every endangered species. And the dots that are being connected, the threads that are coming mm -hmm. together, I love the fact that the communities get to shine around these wild spaces if we get that balance right. Um, we're not going to let you go anywhere. We are still reveling in World Wildlife Day. Yes, but most importantly, some of those milestones and most importantly, those pressure points that we all need to be aware of. It's my feel-good breakfast show. Welcome back. You are tuned into your feel-good breakfast show. Express right here on S3. And we are continuing our reflection on World Wildlife Day right now, observed annually on the 3rd of March, by delving into an important topic. That is the crucial link between wildlife uh, conservation and, of course, local economies as well. Dr. Frank Foris, director of the African Wildlife Economy Institute, joins us as well as the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund is back South Africa, Mornay Duplessis. Gentlemen, welcome back. Um, thanks thank so much you. for sticking around, Monet. We really yeah. do appreciate it. Um, Doc, um, thank you for the work that you do absolutely <laughs> every day. Um, I love the fact that we are starting to move into this this future. Sorry, your socks are distracting us there. Can we just have a close-up on the penguin socks? <laughs> oh, just give them their time to shine. He did say that the penguins were his favourite animal. Well done. Um, I love that. Um, the fact that we are just having this conversation on TV right now means that dots are being connected. Yeah. yeah. Maybe walk us through the relationships where it really comes to bear, where when we get it right, the local communities can benefit when we get the conservation effort right. That balance almost seems to need to be there mm. in order for one or the other to thrive. Can you give us some examples of how that's working? So what you've got, excuse me, you've got um, now is um, increasing recognition that conservation includes use of wild species both consumptive use and non-consumptive use. Mm. So the big one you'd think about immediately is ecotourism. Yeah. Mm. And there's a huge opportunity, and we see it everywhere, of that market to grow. In the African context, the big future is going to be intra-African ecotourism. So you imagine Kenyans coming down here, South Africans going up to oh, Kenya, sure. and so on. And the jobs around the ecotourism economy are huge. Mm. But uh, there's also the, the hunting side of tourism, and this country is very big in that, yeah. and lots of domestic hunting and international hunting and so on, plus fishing, plus adventure tourism. So the whole tourism sector is one sector. Mm. But then there's also the use of wild species, wild plants for medicine, for food, for cosmetics. You can go into the CBD in Joburg and find over 50 places that sell mapani worms. Mm. which is a wild harvested product that is high protein and very, very popular. You have a similar market with grasshoppers. You can still get wild rooibos in the Western Cape, but you've got to look for it because that's become <laughs> mostly farmed. Mm. But it's there. 
And you have the same also with the wildlife, you know, the biltong industry, for example. For sure. Yeah. So all that goes back to the people living on the landscape. Can and do they, and they actually do, have enterprises around wild plants, wild animals, tourism, medicines, food products, and so on. Mm. Look, finding that sweet spot between conservation and economic growth, I mean, that is the actual challenge here, and we spoke about it earlier with Monet. It is a huge collaborative effort. What are some of these strategies, Monet, maybe you can get involved there as well, that you find effective when we look at finding that balance, finding that sweet spot, and how do we go about it? Frank? Okay, I can go, go first. Well, what we're looking at is how can we in the African context, transform and conserve landscapes through a portfolio of, of enterprises based on wild resources. So the sweet spot's going to be, from a conservation perspective, to have not just one use. Mm. So you're not just farming ostriches, or you're not just planting rooibos bushes, but you're actually using a mosaic of the, of the landscape for uses. And some of that's consumptive, non-consumptive, as I said. And we're seeing that now more around the community-based conservancies where people are saying, well, how can we actually manage our indigenous resources and pull out these products like I talked about, medicinal products, health products, mm -hmm. lifestyle products, et cetera. The, um, then what you're not talking about is balance, but you're mm -hmm. actually talking about an economy based on wild assets. So it's a wildlife-based economy. And we see this now, as you were saying, it's spreading all over the place. Yeah. Mm. SADC in a week's time is having the Southern African Development Community is having a launch of the biodiversity-based economy strategy for the whole region, which is all about using wild resources as an economic resource, but of course, using them sustainably, responsibly, mm. et cetera. Uh, Morning, I've got to ask, because I think a lot of conservationists, kind of the hard line, will be thinking, nah, that's not a resource <laughs> we want to dip into. But this speaks to, in the same way that within a business model, you would manage your finances every cent so that you can protect that model moving forward. That speaks to the same notion, but it's got to be from the right basis point. How do we, from the conservation perspective, keep that balance right? Mm. Yeah, I think if we if we talk about keeping areas pristine and uh, you know setting them aside from society, as in nature reserves and traditional national parks, that still costs money yeah. to 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 keep that running. And so, perhaps one of the finest examples I think of a modern way of thinking is uh, sand parks at the moment, in partnership with WWF in the northeastern Cape, is in the process of putting together a contractual park which means people are not moved off the land. They will remain living inside the park, both communities, because there's communal land on the one hand, but also commercial farmers will continue to farm in a conservation-friendly way so that you get multiple use. You get agricultural production at a, a, a sustainable rate. You get uh, byproducts out of wildlife, fishing, uh, hiking, uh, bird watching, botanizing, etc. Cultural tours to look at the rock art, just absolutely phenomenal. And protecting that biodiversity yeah. and everything within that, and it's being owned and protected by the people who actually live there. Mm. Absolutely love that. Monet, Dr. Frank, thank you very much for joining us this morning. I mean, World Wildlife Day is just once again a very important reminder that, yes, this is something that we need to focus on right now. We should have focused on long ago. It is complex, but it also lands on every single individual to give their part and to do what can be done to conserve and look after our environment. Also, make sure that local economies can thrive. And the work with these two gentlemen, like we can see, is absolutely vital. So once again, thank you very much for your efforts. Well Thanks. Done.